Okay, we'll start off with the most important business of the day. Um, there will be stickers coming around. Everyone will get one. So uh, no need to fight. There does not need to be a rampage over the stickers. Plenty to go around. Um, my name is Nathaniel McCollum, uh, CTO of Profian. And we're going to be talking about WASI networking. And in particular, uh, what drove us to propose the addition of SOC Accept to WASI networking, uh, what the most recent developments are in this space, and uh, the unique ways in which uh, the NRX project is using them. So uh, I think a lot of people know uh, the answer to this question, but just in case uh, there's somebody in the room who doesn't and has seen this acronym all over the place on all the talks today and is still uh, abundantly confused, um, WASI is actually a pretty simple concept. Uh, we have uh, our WebAssembly uh, code that's running and we have some native code underneath it and we just need an interface between the two so they can talk to each other. And uh, we can always do this with, with custom APIs, but custom APIs aren't great for building communities and they aren't great for scaling code. And so we want something that's standardized that can give an excellent experience on every language platform uh, out of the box. And so uh, WASI began as, um, uh, we'll, we'll go to the next slide and get a little bit of history here. So uh, WASI actually started uh, as under a different name uh, called Cloud ABI. And uh, along with a few other inspirations um, in um, Cloud ABI started in 2016. And uh, after basically we released the WebAssembly MVP in 2017, uh, people started to think more systematically about this. And so Cloud ABI sort of developed into what we today call WASI, which is a subgroup in the W3C and is actually working on this standard. So uh, at that point, Cloud ABI was deprecated. And so everybody is basically trying to use uh, WASI today with some degree of success. And uh, some, most, some of the more recent developments are the ones I mentioned. Um, basically, we're trying to drive this effort on modularization, uh, which is really important because there's a lot of environments that could uh, use WebAssembly, but they may not be able to expose all of the interfaces that uh, could be available under WASI. So we want to divide up the WASI specification into multiple, multiple different modules so that uh, platforms can support only the APIs that they are able to support. Uh, and then specifically, we added the accept call uh, this last year to Snapshot One. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, the, uh, the WASI snapshot uh, is really insufficient, right? This is what we're all basically trying to run on today. And it has a lot of niceties to it. Um, so it does contain a bunch of interfaces, things like clocks, file systems, networking, uh, arguments, et cetera. Um, however, it, it's really not modular, as I was talking about before. You sort of have to buy into the whole thing. And uh, one, one counter example, for example, of, of where this doesn't work is actually in the NRX project. So uh, although we are working on file system support today, uh, as of today in our latest release, there is no file system support at all. So if you attempt to call any of the file system APIs, you'll simply get an error. Uh, that will magically disappear in a future release, and we will have uh, transparently encrypted file systems. So, uh, so look for things to get better in that regard. But we still need to divide up uh, WASI into multiple different modules so that we can advertise support for different feature sets. And for a long time, modularization has been blocked on interface types and uh, more lately on, on streams, uh, which is currently under active development thanks to many of the people in this room. And we're looking for this glorious future, uh, which will arrive any day now. <laughs> so under WASI Snapshot Zero, uh, if we're just looking at the networking calls, Snapshot Zero had a, a variety of, of interfaces, but if we just look at the networking calls, we really only had three directly having to do with sockets, and that was being able to receive packets, being able to send packets, and being able to close uh, a stream. And uh, it's a remarkably simple API, right? And the question is sort of what can we do with this? Now, there's actually two other sort of interfaces that sneak in under the uh, guise of networking which is pull one off. Uh, pull one off allows you to basically receive a notification when there is IO ready to be performed on a, on a given file descriptor. And of course, uh, there's the non-block flag as well, which allows you to set a file descriptor in a non-blocking mode, which is what allows you to get to this pull event and then it won't block if there's not enough data to read and so forth. So this core uh, basically summarizes what snapshot zero was in terms of networking and um, you should immediately notice a problem that there is no way to create a new socket here. So basically, uh, the runtime could create a set of sockets, could hand it over to the WebAssembly application, 
And you could operate on those sockets, you can read and write on those streams, you could close them, you could wait for I.O., but that's really all you could do. And so uh, we really need the ability to create new sockets, but the problem is, on what capability do we do, we do this? And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with capabilities, um, we need to give a brief introduction to capability-based security. So each WASI call has a capability context. And you can look at two calls there. We have an open call and an open at. Now, uh, WASI has no open call because open is global. It operates on a global context where open at uh, operates on a directory context. So you can say within this directory, open a path. And this actually goes all the way back to the 1960s uh, when we first started to getting memory, memory controllers in our hardware. And so uh, we invented this concept of processes uh, where a process can have a separate address space. So every time you call fork, you basically get a different address space for the process. And the end result of uh, having a different process space means that one application can't muck with another application's memory. And that's a really great feature. The problem is nobody ever thought to extend uh, this notion of privacy or uh, multiple views, today we would call them namespaces in the Linux, Linux kernel, uh, to all of the other resources that are available on the system. So for example, while you've got a private view of memory, you've got a global view of the file system. So everybody saw all the same files on the disk and the only, the only um, access control you had was whether you had permissions to access that file. Uh, it was the same thing with networking. You typically would have a set of networking interfaces on a Linux system, and if you had access to one of them, you had access to all of them, or plus or minus. And so, um, basically, capabilities provide us a low-cost alternative to OS namespacing. And so there's been a significant amount of effort, of course, basically all of containers are built on top of operating system namespacing, where you can actually create different namespaces for network interfaces and file systems and give people separate views of those. Um, but capability-based security basically says we're not gonna have any APIs that don't have a context to them. And so what this means is that we can always uh, create private views of the resources on the system because every API receives a context. And so what we want basically is we want a system where there are no global resources and the runtime run can always uh, indicate uh, which resources a particular uh, WebAssembly uh, executable has. So this poses particular challenges for the global APIs that we all know and love, uh, particularly in the networking world, where you're typically used to having a global view of um, network uh, addresses and so forth, and uh, you operate in this global context. Well, when we're trying to do capability-based security in WASI, that's not exactly a great fit, and there's a, there's a tension there. Uh, but it's not just uh, the Berkeley sockets, it's also file systems. Uh, so we've solved this pretty efficiently uh, with using OpenAT, for example. But even today, for file systems, for example, if you look at the Rust standard API uh, and compare it with OpenAT, OpenAT takes a directory file descriptor. Well, Rust doesn't expose at all in their standard library a uh, primitive for operating on open directories. And so even though the underlying operating system does provide OpenAT, the Rust standard library provides no way to actually access that. So uh, the fundamental situation we found ourselves in with, with Snapshot Zero was that there was no way to create new sockets. The runtime could create sockets ahead of time, could hand them to the runtime, you could read and write on them, you could close them, but that was it. If you wanted to do more, you were out of luck. So fortunately, uh, we were able to uh, rev this to Snapshot One. And in Snapshot One, we got most of, this, most of the same stuff, but uh, we at Profian felt pretty constrained by not being able to create any incoming connections. And so we essentially proposed the addition of sock accept as an API. And um, I, I think it's great. Everyone was pretty enthused about this. We were able to move really quickly. Uh, Profian sponsored addition of the entire networking stack into uh, the Rust standard library. And we also provided patches to WASI libc. Uh, there are a number of people here who, um, like Microsoft, for example, has done this in .NET. So uh, it's great to see a lot of people taking this up. And basically what it means is uh, we do ha now have the ability to accept incoming uh, sockets. And the reason we can do this is because when you pre-create a listening socket in the Berkeley Sockets API, that listening socket already provides a context. So we, we are not violating capability-based uh, security here. We are just simply uh, using the incoming listening socket uh, as, as that context. And so it was pretty easy to add this. 
And so as, as I mentioned, uh, there's, this has been uh, implemented in a variety of places. Um, this has been a lot of work. Profian has done some of this work, but others have, have done it as well. So thanks to everyone who's contributed. And uh, basically what we see is um, in Maine right now, in WASI libc, there is SOC accept support. So this means anybody who is consuming WASI libc as their interface to WASI uh, automatically gets uh, SOC accept as part of this. This would include a bunch of the dynamic languages like Python and Ruby and so forth. In the Rust world, uh, we added uh, support for networking to the standard library. This is available in Nightly. We also added support to MIO to be able to support pull one-off. Uh, which it couldn't currently support, and so now MIO actually supports the ability to do uh, non-blocking IO uh, based in WASI. Uh, we currently have somebody working on getting Tokyo up and running, so we would really like to see the entirety of the, the Tokyo framework, and we're also evaluating uh, asyncs to, if you are, and if anyone in this room is interested in collaborating with these, we would love to have your collaboration. Uh, this is work that really benefits everybody, so we'd love to make a, a good showing of it. <coughs> Um, so, uh, as we look beyond WASI snapshot one, however, we, we still have uh, a variety of things that have to happen in order for us to make forward progress. Uh, fortunately, we have pretty mature interface types at this point. Uh, the tooling is rapidly maturing in this, in this area. Um, we are also starting to get st the streams definition to be somewhat mature. Um, I'm hoping that this will accelerate in the coming days as people show more and more interest in it. I think it's pretty clear um, and uh, there was at least four talks, I think, that mentioned that their biggest pain point in WebAssembly today was networking. So it, it seems to me that there's a pretty broad consensus uh, that this is something we need to pay attention to. Um, we really need to target three different scenarios. And uh, right now there's a lot of work being done in the last one, but I wanna talk about what these three are. And I wanna talk about uh, the subtle differences between them and why I think we need to actually adopt all of them. So the subtle difference between them is, uh, the first one is blocking. And blocking is the old Berkeley sockets that we know and love you know, since time immemorial. Uh, you, if you uh, create a socket um, and do a connect, you're gonna wait until you know, that connection completes before the function returns. The same thing with reading or writing and so forth. Um, Non-blocking was a mode that was added to this where you could set the non-blocking flag on the socket. And then if there was no IO available to be performed and you did a read, for example, uh, the function would return immediately and would, with an error E again, saying that you need to be called, you need to call this function again when there's actually IO available. And so this uh, is combined with then with a polling function of some kind. In WASI, this is poll one off. And um, with poll one off, what it allows you to do is you can call poll one off, and poll one off will block regardless what the state of the non blocking flag is. And so when pull one off returns, it gives you an indication that there is IO ready uh, to be performed, and then you can call the non-blocking read, and instead of receiving that E again error, you will instead receive uh, some of the data that was available on that connection. And so we might call this, uh, I got this term from Dan Gumman, uh, this is notification, a notification mode. Async is different, but it's very subtly different. Uh, async is where we indicate to uh, the kernel or the runtime that we want to perform some, some I.O. And that function immediately returns, and then we can call another function later to block, and it returns only when the I.O. is complete. So the distinction between non-blocking and async is that non-blocking provides you a notification that I.O. is available, and then you perform a non-blocking read, where async uh, you give an indication that you want to do a read, and then you call a function that blocks until all of the data is available. So notification versus completeness. Thank you, Dan Gumman, for, uh, for that great phrase. Um, and so uh, we still also need to port existing tooling to it by gen, and I know Dan is working on that furiously. Um, we also have a new networking proposal um, that's been proposed. And the, the proposal that's, that has been proposed is fairly reminiscent of what we know of from traditional Berkeley sockets. But that may actually pose some problems, and you'll see why when we get to the NARCS demo in a moment, um, because one of the things it does is it exposes all of the lower level protocols, and then one of the questions is, do we actually want to expose all of those lower level protocols, or do we really just wanna say, I have this named thing, maybe it's an outgoing connection, maybe it's an incoming connection, and I wanna perform operations on it, but all of the details of what that thing actually is may be hidden by the runtime. 
You'll see why this is important for a moment. Uh, we do, spoiler alert, we do transparent TLS in NRCs. So when you create sockets, uh, you're automatically getting a TLS socket. It's not TCP. We don't allow the use of TCP at all. Um, so this does provide some challenges, for example, for TLS. Um, it also provides challenges if we're just going to wrap the, uh, the bare Berkeley sockets API and expose all the underlying protocols, it also means that we are going to have difficulties with multi-layer policy. For example, if, let's say in a world where you're not, you're not doing transparent TLS like NRX is, um, and you want to do TCP operations, but you also want to do TLS operations, well, how do you control the policy over which is allowed to which hosts? It becomes a fairly complex problem to, to um, figure out what the actual interactions are in between those things. And the reason for that is because TLS is a species of TCP. So now you have to, on every packet, you have to analyze, okay, if TLS isn't allowed, is this packet that I'm receiving on TCP actually a, T, a, a TLS packet? And if it is, then I have to evaluate it on my policy. So now we're sort of forcing everyone into, into deep packet inspection, which is probably not a place where we wanna be. So we really need some good thinking about this. And really this is just an invitation to participate. I know there's a lot of people in this room that really care about uh, WASI, care about networking. So this is a really good opportunity to contribute to this discussion and help us create a design that uh, looks really good. By the way, all my credit goes to the, uh, the author of the proposal. It's a very thorough proposal, um, so I'm not knocking him at all. And uh, it's really just a matter of what can we come up with is that that's the best and fits the needs of the community the best. So uh, we actually have a demo today, and I wanna be able to demo essentially what you can create in a, uh, in a SOC accept enabled world. So everything you're gonna see today is running today on the most recent release of NRX, uh, which was last, last week, uh, 0.5. And uh, we're gonna show uh, an application called Crypto. And Crypto is a uh, clone of everyone's favorite game, Wordle, uh, except it is done in an encrypted environment. And first we're gonna show it running in NRX just so you can get a feel of what the application does. Then we're gonna attack Crypto uh, on Wasm Time. And I'm not singling out Wasm Time here as the bad guy. Okay, Wasm Time is fantastic. We use Wasm Time internally. Okay, what I am trying to show by using Wasm Time here is that we're gonna take the same exact WebAssembly binary that we ran in Wasm Time, and we're gonna deploy that binary using NRX, and we're gonna get a bunch of other uh, protections for free. And so, uh, so we're, gonna, we're gonna show an attack uh, on crypto using Wasm Time. We're gonna do an attack retrospective. We're gonna analyze why the attack uh, worked and what we could do to stop it. And then we're gonna try the same attack uh, on, on NRX. I need to pause here for a moment because a huge thank needs to go out to Harold Hoyer, Richard Zach, uh, Roman who's here, Wave Roman, and uh, Nick Vidal uh, who's also here. Nick, wave Nick, wherever you are. Um, you guys put in a tremendous amount of work on this demo and I'm just uh, really pleased to work with you all. So um, thank you very much. By the way, Harold was supposed to be giving this talk today, uh, but his wife is expecting. So if you know Harold, send him a congratulations. All right, hopefully this video is gonna come, up here, come up here. Go, go, gadget internet. This is when you record the video so you don't have problems, and then of course you have problems with the video. Oh, there we go, okay. So uh, we have this game Crypto, and Crypto is basically a multiplayer Wordle demo. And uh, you can guess some words on the left. And one of the things that's different about Crypto compared to the normal Wordle game is that in the normal Wordle game, the word that is actually guessed, the word list, is, is all actually in the client, it's not on the server. So anyone who uh, is good at inspecting uh, in the uh, browser console, they can figure out what the word is. But we wanted to do something that's, that's more secure. We want the, the word to actually be chosen on the server side. And then more than that, we wanted to allow multiple players to guess, and we wanted them to see when they actually guess other players' words. So this is not a, uh, this is not a super competitive game, it's just a game for a little bit of fun. And so we have three players here, and uh, they're all basically playing uh, the crypto game, and you can see, uh, oh, we got words, we got three letters there. And now we're gonna guess world and see we, we actually guessed one of the other player's words. And so it showed up uh, in a special color. And finally, we're gonna play on the, on the third player here. And uh, we're gonna be doing the same thing. Just guessing letters. Uh, wh while this is playing, I'm gonna make a, a brief PR announcement. We did release last week 0.5. Uh, we now have support for running NRX in the unencrypted mode on both Mac OS and your favorite Raspberry Pi. 
Uh, this is uh, in preparation, by the way, for uh, Arm Realms, which has been publicly announced. So um, stay tuned for news in that regard. So basically, we've, we've seen our application here, and uh, we, we've guessed uh, another word here, and, and that's more or less, uh, we can see who the winners were based on this. So now what we wanna do is we actually want to, th this was actually shown, by the way, this is running in Anarchs uh, on the latest release, and we're gonna, we're gonna skip ahead. And we're gonna do the, we're gonna show the application running on Amazon Time. So, the text is probably a little small, hopefully you can see it. We're gonna do a cargo build of this Rust crate. And the Rust crate is, crate is just the crypto crate. You can actually see this. Uh, there'll be a URL for the, for the demo later if you'd like to see it. Um, and so we, we have run it in WASM time. It's now listening on a socket. But what we want to do is we are an attacker who has managed to gain root access on the server. And we're trying desperately to get this most prized Wordle word. And so what we want to do is we want to scan the memory of the application for any of the words that are in the dictionary because we want to find out what the word is, basically bypassing the, guesses, the guessing rule. Here, here, by the way, you should understand that the guessing rules in Wordle are really just the access controls of your application. And we want to, by accessing this host, you're gonna see here in red, we found words that are in the word list. And so, as we scan this memory for the application, we pick up, I think there's, there's three words uh, in this particular instance. Yeah, there's youth, and there's one more. And so, uh, although WASM time has performed spectacularly, uh, we are performing an attack that is out of scope for, this, for the security model of WASM time. Um, so again, WASM time's not to blame, and if we were running this in NRCs uh, in debug mode, you'd see exactly the same thing. You'd be able to uh, access the memory and bypass it. So the question is, why did this at attack succeed? And the fundamental problem is that uh, we have three different uh, forms of workload isolation. Uh, type one is protecting one workload from another. Type two is protecting uh, a, the host from a malicious workload. Uh, and both of those we actually can do pretty well today, right? There's lots of companies doing this at scale, so this is not a problem. Uh, the problem is we don't have really any protection uh, until confidential computing for the third type of isolation, which is protecting a particular workload from the host. Because currently the host has access to read all the memory of the application and can tamper with that application while it's running and so forth. And uh, this is fine, right? Um, basically, as long as you trust your CSP and all of their sysadmins and all of the hardware, software, and firmware stack. So fortunately, it's not millions of lines of code or, oh wait, yeah, it is. And then uh, from either compromise, because they may not be doing it directly, they may just have not been able to secure something, or for a supply chain of attack on the, on the um, actual operating system, uh, both now and in the future, right? Uh, so, and that's of course if you agree with also your CFO and your board and your auditor and your regulator. So all of these are, uh, this is a pretty high list of criteria in order to be able to trust it. And this is something we just sort of accept in the industry today, and we accept it because we aren't aware that there's another way to operate, and that's because the hardware simply hasn't been available. But uh, not, all, not all clouds are good. So uh, the question is, what makes NRCs different? And how NRCs is different is that we use confidential computing. Confidential computing is a new set of hardware technologies that have come out from our, all of our favorite CPU manufacturers. For example, Intel, AMD, uh, and ARM has also announced uh, ARM 9 Realms. And basically this allows you to create an application or a virtual machine within which the memory pages are actually encrypted. And so while the actual application is running, even if the host can scan memory of a normal application. If you've set up this normal, there are this special confidential application correctly, then you won't you won't be able to uh, to tamper with it. So we use trusted computing environments, which is based on CPU hardware. We encrypt the workloads, and we, and we provide two things that are really important. And and the NRX project will not uh, implement on a TEE platform if it does not provide these two properties. We want integrity, and we want confidentiality. In other words, no peeking, no sneaking. So, uh, or peeking and tweaking, that's the, that's the phrase, peeking and tweaking. So um, basically, what you wanna do is you wanna have start off with your workload here, and you wanna put the workload in the host somehow. 
But the problem is, how do you actually know that the workload that you are attempting to deploy to that, uh, to that host is in fact the workload that gets deployed? And we should be thinking of this as a certain kind of supply chain attack. We tend to think of supply chain attacks as everything north of me. I grew up in upstate New York, and if you ask anyone where is upstate New York, any New Yorker will reply to you, well, it's what's north of me. Right? So if you live in New York City, upstate New York, if there's anything north of New York City. If you live in Albany, well then upstate New York is anything north of Albany. Uh, well, the, the, same, the same thing applies here. Um, downstream from you is also a supply chain attack. And so what we want to do is we want to create this TEE, and we want to create a measurement of the application, or in this case the NRX runtime, and then we want to offload that measurement signed by the hardware to an attestation service. And the attestation service must not be in your cloud because your cloud provider can't t prove to you that they set up you, the environment correctly. You need an independent source of trust. So uh, we offload the measurements to an attestation service, and the attestation service proves to you cryptographically that the environment that was set up is, uh, has those two properties, confidentiality and integrity. But what we actually want to do is something more than that because we actually want to create an empty keep there's uh, several systems out there today that, that try to do something like this, but they deploy the application immediately into an untrusted system, and what if the algorithms of that application, right, what if it's a risk model and you're an insurer, or what if it's an AI model, or what if it's an, any of these types of uh, code that need to be protected, uh, of which there's quite a few today. And so what we want to do is we want to bring up an empty keep that can, we call this an undifferentiated keep. It contains only the NRX runtime, and that's what we measure. And then uh, the attestation service validates this for us and provides a certificate identifying the workload that gets deployed in that keep. The, once, it ha once the keep has the certificate, it can then fetch an application from Drawbridge. You can think of Drawbridge as something like an attestation aware Docker Hub, uh, where it contains the software, all the software that you're going to be deploying, and it will only release that software if you perform a successful attestation to the steward. And so we can show this same exact demo uh, on NRX. Now one of the things that's uh, not immediately obvious here is that when we ran on WASM time, our sockets were unencrypted. Well, what's gonna happen when we run this time on NRX, we're gonna do the exactly the same thing, deploy exactly the same binary, but we're gonna do the attestation, we're gonna get a certificate that identifies the workload, and then we can do transparent TLS on everything that's involved. Coming soon will be transparent and, uh, encrypted file system as well, so anything that you persist to the disk is always encrypted. The point is, once data or code enters the system, it never leaves unencrypted unless you do something seriously, seriously wrong. We can't make it impossible to do the right thing, but we can make it hard. So uh, this is an example of, uh, this is the WASM time, we're gonna kill that, that was previously running. And we're just gonna do the same thing, we're gonna start it using NRX instead of WASM time. And we have this configuration file that identifies the environment and which steward to contact for the certificate. Uh, this, this file is going to uh, come from the drawbridge. Uh, in the future, but what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna do an upload to drawbridge of the files. We're gonna upload the WASM file and we're gonna upload the nrx.toml. And once those are both in the drawbridge, they are now ready to be deployed. So the upload is completed, and now we're just going to do an nrx deploy, giving the URL of the particular application. Normally we have a shorter slug here that's, that's more similar to uh, the Docker style but we're specifying a full URL here because the drawbridge is running locally and unencrypted. Uh, the uh, support for unencrypted drawbridge will go away. It's, it's just currently there uh, to support this latest release. So uh, it's taking a moment here to actually start. It's a little bit longer to bring up because we have to bring up the hardware environment. We have to do a bunch of cryptography. We have to contact the steward and do our attestation, receive our certificate, set up all of our sockets. But once that's done, uh, there we go, now, we're, now we've switched to the scanning page. Uh, the application is running. We are gonna do the same scanning attack that we saw before. This time we're going to scan for NRX instead of WASM time. And we're gonna do the same, the same mem dump we had just with the different PID. This time it's the PID for NRX. And you notice that we've not found any words. And the reason for this is because all of the memory is encrypted. 
um, on different hardware platforms. Uh, th this was on Intel SGX. Uh, we can also do this on AMD SEV SNP, which is the latest Milan generation. And if you do this on SNP, uh, you'll actually get a denial because the hardware actually denies access to the memory that's inside of the encrypted VM. So if you'd like to find more about the NRX project, uh, as I said, we just uh, released our, our uh, 0.5 uh, last week. We have releases coming every four weeks now, and uh, it's, it's a train, so if you want to contribute, please come hop on the train with us. Uh, you can go to the website, nrx.dev. We have a blog, we have GitHub, we have chat as well. Um, we're a friendly bunch of people, so come along and uh, help us build a better future. Oh, by the way, Profian's hiring. So if you're like a crackpot, you know, ninja wizard at doing all sorts of like ops stuff and you like you know, performance and low level hardware stuff or cryptography, if any of that intersection interests you, we're doing really, really cool work and we have a great team of people, so come check us out. Oh yeah, there is, there is one more thing. Today we're announcing the Crypto Hack Challenge. And uh, basically, we want to see what your elite skills are. We want to know if you can actually hack the NRX runtime. Now, I do have to give a little bit of caveat here is that although NRX is very close to production, we're nearing production uh, capability, this is still a pre-production release, but, but we want you to help us find the issues uh, before real attackers do. So we want to see if you can prove it. Uh, there's going to be a cake, and by cake we, we mean prizes. Uh, this will include uh, some hardware and will include some cash. And uh, we are going to basically, uh, if you have an attack, you submit the attack to us. We will run the attack on the server, and uh, we're going to live stream the whole thing. So we'll see if your attack succeeds or fails. And if, if it it succeeds, you win a prize. And uh, all of the winners will be announced uh, at Black Hat. We're going to be doing this in two phases. So the first phase will be announced at Black Hat. So come along and uh, and show us your show us your stuff. Questions? Yes. That is correct. So please open your phones, go to GitHub, star the project, and win a free T-shirt. Yep, NRX slash NRX. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, you have a question. Um, they have not been put up on YouTube, but we can put them on YouTube. Yes. Repeat your question for the streaming. Okay. Uh, will the demo be available on YouTube? Yes, we can soon? put we can put the demo on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Nick, can you take a note to make sure it's on YouTube? Nick's going to take care of it. Thank you very much, everybody.